My name is Pat Adams, a spiritual director and blogger about the spiritual life. The consuming interest of my life has been this, how do I, how do we live a life centered in God? And yet deeper still, who am I really? What is my purpose? How do I connect deeply with God? These are the questions I will address in this video series. Does the gospel serve our purposes or do we serve the gospel? As we Christians face the declining importance of the church in American life, I think that we have to acknowledge that we've been off message for a long time, that we've preached the gospel more than we have lived it, that we've used the gospel for our own ends, that we've done a lot of harm while we were trying to do good. So the question that I just posed, are we using the gospel for our own purposes or for God's purposes, is an important one for us to address. I plan to look at some ways that we can use the gospel for our own means, but first let's start with what I think characterized Jesus' ministry and teaching. What a summary of his teachings would consist. It's this, he tempered the law with love. He violated the law on the Sabbath to meet human needs. He healed and his disciples picked and ate heads of grain. He hung out with the untouchables and rejects of society. He called out the Pharisees and the scribes for their rigid adherence to the law, but they had no justice or mercy or faithfulness or love in their hearts. He summarized all his teachings about the law and the two great commandments, which were all about loving, loving God with all of ourselves and loving our neighbor as ourselves. The Pharisees misused the law for their own purposes, not to serve God. I think that we widely berate the Pharisees as Jesus did, but I do think they represent the range of human behavior which falls short of Jesus' teachings about love. Matthew chapter 23 is devoted to his charges against the Pharisees. There Jesus lists the complaints he has about them and the scribes. Let's look at each one and think about how they might apply to us today. First, they do not practice what they preach. Jesus complains that we should do what they say, but not what they do. He's talking about hypocrisy. Their inner state belies what they say. This is a lack of integrity in which they hide their true feelings while trying to look good. Secondly, they tie up heavy burdens for others, but they're unwilling to help them move them. The Pharisees taught everyone to behave like they did, following the letter of the law, so that those instructed would be as off base as the Pharisees themselves. This is self-serving. And it goes along with another complaint, that they lock people out of the kingdom, converting others and making them just like the Pharisees who Jesus called children of hell. Third, they do their deeds to be seen by others. They love the seat of honor in the synagogue and at the banquets and being called rabbi. They love the trappings of the office, but do not serve the people. They should not be called rabbi, according to Jesus, because there's only one teacher, the Messiah. Fourth, they argue that the gold in the temple or the gift on the altar is more important to swear by than the sanctuary or the altar itself. They confuse the holy with the decoration. They nitpick so they look important, so that they are the authority on the law. Fifth, they tithe herbs but neglect the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. Jesus put it this way in verse two, you blind guides, you strain out a gnat, then swallow a camel. Six, they clean the outside of the cup and plate, but are filled with greed and self-indulgence. Or they're like whitewashed tombs that are full of the bones of the dead and all kinds of filth. They have no integrity. They're only interested in looking good. Seven, they claim that they're better than their ancestors, 
who slayed the prophets, sages, and scribes when they are cut from the same cloth. And then they kill Jesus. Hypocrisy. Jesus is also speaking to us Pharisees today. Where do we display hypocrisy, use the law for our own purposes, lack integrity, nitpick, look good on the outside, but lack love, justice, and mercy on the inside? Where do we trap converts into our own dilemmas? Where do we use the gospel for our own purposes to make ourselves look good, to promote our own agendas? In contrast, the great message of the gospel is that love is the key, that all the laws fall under the law of love of God and neighbor. So if we are true followers of Jesus, we'll be known by his love, which flows out of us to everyone we meet. We'll be at peace, live with joy and gratitude, love and forgive, have patience and self-control, be kind and gentle, be good. These are the signs of a deep relationship with Christ, the fruits of the Spirit that are given to us as we follow the way. We will be congruent. Words and actions will have the same meaning. We'll not be saying one thing and doing the opposite. Otherwise, we're off message. We're picking and choosing Bible verses that are taken out of context in order to support what we're trying to say and to justify what we want to do. This is not following the gospel. We Christians have done it throughout history to justify what we want to do in the Crusades, in the doctrine of just wars, in the treatment of the mentally ill, in witch hunts, in converting many native populations by force, in justifying slavery or for being against it, and more. I want to talk for a few minutes about two issues that we're battling over in this postmodern era and their relevance to this issue of serving ourselves or serving the gospel. The first is abortion. I am confident that God is on the side of life, of the continuation of all life, and on the side of the woman who is contemplating having an abortion. What has been interesting to me in this issue is that the pro-lifers have no concern for the child or its mother once it is born. The fervor that sustains the abortion wars evaporates once the child is born. There is no equal fervor to give him and his family help if they need it, to feed and clothe and educate the child. The fervor stops at the birth. Here's where I think Christ would be with the woman and child in their circumstances, never abandoning them to their lot in life, and with the woman who had the abortion. Embalming abortion clinics? Are we justified in going that far to prevent abortions? Certainly Pope Francis has asked Catholics to back off the abortion issue somewhat because it's been the center of the faith for a while. These are just some things to think about no matter which side of the issue we are on. The second contemporary issue is homosexuality. And let's see if we can open this up a bit. I think that the biblical references on this issue are pretty lame. If it's so abhorrent, why is it not mentioned in the Ten Commandments or by Jesus? That's my first point. And this goes to today's topic of self-serving or serving the gospel. Many of us are repulsed by intimate gay practices. Have we then scoured the Bible searching for any argument that we can make to justify condemning them? Are we using the gospel for our own purposes rather than serving the gospel? And here's my second point. I think that today Jesus would stand with the homosexuals. He'd be hanging out with them, befriending them, not preaching at them. The only people he preached at were the Pharisees and the scribes, not the poor, the hated, or the rejects of his society and times. We might find him today with the whole LGBT community, whether we liked it or not. 
We can project what we think or wish Jesus would do, but he didn't condemn the prostitute. He only asked that she sin no more. Is homosexuality a sin? I don't think we have any proof in the Bible that it is. Maybe our problem is that we think Jesus thought just like we do. Sure, he hung out with all those people, but really, we have the same values. He'd agree with me. I can continue to be the kind of person I am, hold the same values. Yes, I believe in Jesus, so it's okay that I pursue what's on my own agenda because he'd come along. When I look around me, there are tons of people on my side. Why not him? But remember that Jesus was a radical in his day, calling the powers that be to account to the law of love. Today, he is that same radical calling us to account before the same law of love. The whole journey with Jesus is to get over the Pharisee within us, the one who serves himself, the one who focuses on the tiny things and lets the big ones go, the one who is a hypocrite, who speaks of how pure he is, but doesn't account for his own internal condition of judgment and hatred and condemnation, the one who promotes himself above all others. It is easy to find justification for anything we want to do in the Bible by taking a passage out of context. We can quote chapter and verse as both sides, the North and the South, did during our Civil War. The proof of whether we're using or serving the gospel is in our words and actions and attitudes. Are we loving, at peace, joyful, forgiving, and kind? Or are we self-satisfied, condemning, judgmental, and smug? Do we rail at everyone else for their sins and fail to address our own? Do we know the difference between the ego satisfaction and the embrace of love? Are we to be love in this world or are we here to call out the sins of others? Are we sinners pointing fingers at others or are we loving them as they are? They too were created and are loved by God. In Jesus' encounter with a prostitute, he invited those without sin to throw the first stone. The crowd dissolved away. Then Jesus said to the woman, go and sin no more. Notice there's no condemnation, no listing of her sins or talk about how bad she is, just the challenge to go and sin no more. Love alone does the challenging. Love raises the issue with a person of where they are not serving the gospel. Love does not detail the sin. Love embraces the person, shines a light in all the dark corners of a person's life, makes it easier for them to change. It's not our job to judge or condemn. In fact, we love that job so much, we easily slip into that role and forget how far we ourselves are from hitting the mark of loving God, of putting God first in our lives. Rather than facing ourselves, we project our sin onto others. How self-serving is that? As long as we look for sin in everyone else, as long as we reject any parts of ourselves as not acceptable to God, this is how long we will be pushing away God's love for us. My personal goal is to feel God's love in every cell in my body, it's taken a long time for me to even begin to feel his love. What I've learned is that God is always offering us his love for the good, the bad, and the ugly in us. But we don't feel worthy of it, so we push it away. We can't wholly love God. We sure don't love ourselves. And therefore, we can't love anyone else. So how do we get from erecting walls and pushing God's love away to allowing God to love us? We need his help to accomplish this. We need his help with tearing down the walls between us, the walls of guilt and shame and self-protection erected by us. 
then little by little, as we began to turn the eyes of love on ourselves, and as God's love seeps into us, healing the things inside us, the guilt and shame that would push love away, we are capable of loving, embracing, accepting, listening to, acknowledging, being patient with, taking joy in others. The challenge for us Christians today is to live the gospel, to put it first above anything that we think or decide. We have sworn to serve its message and its teacher, Jesus. Now is the time for us to live the life that serves the gospel, that pours the love out of us that Jesus has given us. No longer is it any good to just proclaim it, but not have it influence every word we speak, every action we take, even the thoughts we think. The church that supported that kind of hypocrisy is dying. It's a slow death, but it will die. Will you serve the gospel or use it for your own ends? Will you be part of the new church, the one the Holy Spirit is raising up in its place, the one in which the hymn, they will know we are Christians by our love, by our love, will ring true and free. Thank you for watching. I look forward to hearing from you soon. 